let me, of course, welcome you uh, to this uh, plenary, which is on uh, leveraging engine development. And uh, basically, what have we been doing for the last 30 years, and what would our experts suggest that India does in the next 30 years uh, going forward? Uh, we have an outstanding panel uh, consisting of, to my extreme left, uh, Professor Somesha Dutta from the Cornell uh, University, uh, impeccable education background uh, from IIT, the best uh, engineering college in, in New Delhi uh, and India. I mean, it's based in New Delhi, but it's uh, the sort of uh, absolute at the top in Indian education. He went on to do his PhD finally in Berkeley, and he's also been the dean of the business school at Cornell. But most importantly, he created the Global Innovation Index for the United Nations, and perhaps he will tell us as to how India has climbed up slowly and steadily, and how it can accelerate on this index going forward over the next few years. To my left, we have uh, Nasir Munji, who is the chairman of DCB Bank, and on the board of certain uh, blue chip companies, the Tata Motors, Cummins, ABB, and of course, Jaguar Land Rover, uh, which is now a Tata Group company. He is an economist by training, but most importantly, he is being a pioneer in the field of infrastructure development and financing. And he will talk about the huge gap that we have to fill up and how in the next 30 years that is going to be a big growth uh, momentum and big growth driver for us in the Indian economy. Uh, to my right is Richard Reiki, a very dear friend of mine for the last two decades. And of course, he is, uh, what should I say, a truly outstanding uh, consultant, advisor, counselor. Uh, he has been uh, with Anderson in the consulting field and then KPMG in the consulting field. And indeed, he was the, the head of uh, KPMG in, in India till very recently when he, he, he retired from there. And of course, he's still involved with them and very involved in the consulting field. Uh, he's got a good knowledge of the ecosystem of startups in India. And we look forward to sharing as to how these startups are going to create thousands and thousands of jobs in India and uh, how it's going to change the India of the future, the India of tomorrow. And to my extreme right is also a regular lightning of the Horatius and a friend of Frank. Uh, she, Miriana, is a global entrepreneur. She is a member of the Trinity Council for Angel Investors in Europe. So both of you have a lot in common, and we look forward to hearing uh, both of you chatting about that. But he is also the CFO of the largest group in Southeast Europe, employing 12,000 people, and also in investment funding, and he manages those funds. Uh, so we look forward to hearing more on that because very recently she had the experience of entering the Indian market through a joint venture with one of her fellow alumnus from the Harvard Business School. So welcome to you and welcome to all of you. And uh, you, you're calling me, you want to kick off? I would like to correct you. I, I want to say so. You don't have to correct me. Company. Whatever I say is correct. You can take it as an interview. All right. Well, then, let me just take you very quickly back 30 years ago. India, in 1991, was on the verge of bankruptcy. Our foreign exchange reserves had dropped to 1 billion US dollars after having pledged 450 tons of our gold reserves. Our GDP was down to just 1%. No new jobs were being created. Our industrial growth was a negative 2%. Our 
and that was kind of India being on the precipice. And that unleashed the reforms, that unleashed the liberalization process, and we've had a lot of reforms taking us over from a position of great weakness to a position of great strength where we are today. And of course, the whole question is, how can we leverage this further over the next two or three decades? So, without any further ado, let, let me lean now on our uh, sort of panelists. And if I may begin with you, so much, sir, if you could give us your vision and your advice, perhaps, to the government as to what we need to do to keep India on the growth momentum. So thank you very much uh, for your introduction and your kind words. Uh, at the very outset, I want to state very clearly that I am actually very, very optimistic about India for the next decade or longer. I think the current uh, majority that the current government enjoys the decisive win of Prime Minister Modi in the last election is extremely good news for India and for the world. So I think that's the starting point. Now, having said this, um, what are some areas where maybe India and collective community needs to think a little bit more carefully? So the first point I would say really is a very pure and simple question of what is India's strategy? Now, being a professor in a business school, in the field of strategy, you have to answer some basic questions. And using the metaphor of the game, you have to be able to first answer the question, what is the game you're playing? Are you playing American football? Are you playing soccer? Who's the opponent you're trying to beat? Is it China? Is it the US? Is it some other country you're trying to actually compete against? Com competition, by the way, does not exclude collaboration. And the third important question is, what are the rules by which you're going to actually play and engage and hopefully win? And what I feel Prime Minister Modi and the government should really do is engage in a deep reflection with some of the best minds inside the country, outside the country, in trying to answer some very few questions about India's strategy. What does India hope to do over the next 10 years? And I don't just mean the development of the country internally, which of course will not to be done, but also what is India's role in the world? Because India will grow into a five trillion economy in the next decade. India will be the third largest economy in the world. And an important question in this context is what is India's role in the world? Because today, at some point, some people in fact fear that the future of the world is being defined by essentially the US and China to a large degree. People even question the role of Europe in this definition of the world's future. And I think we have to be able to have some at least thinking about what is India's role in the future, what is India's strategy. And I say this also because I travel a lot to China like many of you and I interact with Chinese students that come out. And one thing that strikes me, and this is quite amazing, is it doesn't matter which level of society you interact with in China, uh, there is a very clear common vision of what China is trying to be. People might express it differently, but pretty much what everyone, at least a large number of Chinese believe, China is once again trying to reclaim as number one thing in the world, essentially means becoming better, bigger, stronger than the U.S. in this case. Now, I'm not trying to debate if it's the right target, wrong target, but at least there's a clarity of vision, clarity of purpose, clarity of action. And I think that is something which we don't necessarily have in India, both inside and outside. So that's the first point I'd like to make. The second point I'd like to make is linked to my own research. As was mentioned, I did spend the last 10 years of my life or more working in the area of innovation. I created something called the Global Innovation Index, which is used for the government of India, government of China, many of the governments around the world. And that basically has helped many countries understand their innovation performance, uh, put in place policies to improve innovation performance inside their own countries or regions. 
and essentially create models and make progress. Now, India's innovation performance has been improving, so that's good news compared to the last decade. I think India has progressively improving, and certainly India is now ranked at position number 57 in the Global Innovation Index. But the interesting question is, how is India positioned for the coming disruption? So the cost of missing a disruption in technology is actually very high. In India, we know that to some degree because 20 years ago, we were clear leaders in the IT sector. There's no question about it. 20 years ago, Indian companies were the leaders in the IT sector along with American companies. And fast forward today's era of the digital economy, the leaders today are the American companies and Chinese companies. Indian companies are still very successful, but not necessarily among the leaders in the digital economy. Why? Because India sort of missed the digital economy disruption, internet disruption, for a number of reasons. You can debate what the reasons are, the number of reasons we missed that disruption. Now, the next disruption is coming, which is the disruption of AI, the disruption of quantum computing, combined with the disruption of biology and physical robotics, nanotechnology, and all these other progressions. Now, the question really is who's going to dominate the space? And the country that will actually dominate the space will reap tremendous advantages in leadership in defining the future. And that's one reason why you hear of all this race now between the U.S. and China dominate the AI space. And not just because AI is interesting, but because there's so much associated with that kind of leadership, the future will essentially define the countries that will assume the leadership position. So one question that I have for India and Indian government really is what India's strategy for this disruption in the future? Because if we miss the next disruption, it will be a very painful, slow process of drawing back some kind of good progress. And the thing that happened right now, we missed the digital revolution in some sense, but now India is clawing back its way thanks to the Aadhaar system, thanks to the India staff, thanks to some actually pretty innovative work done by the Indian government in the last six, seven years. But that is a slow progress back. India may still find a third way to enter the digital economy as a leader, but we're not yet there. And if we don't actually invest for the next wave of digital disruption, for biological disruption, we may have to wait for many more years to, in fact, find the leadership out there or to find another alternative way to get there because the country that will dominate the space will really keep the domination for a long time. So innovation, I think, is very important. I could talk to you about other aspects of innovation, how we need to invest more in R&D, how we need to actually change the educational system and so on, other aspects. But let me keep that for the future discussion. So let me just sort of focus on those two points in terms of defining what is India's role and being more clear about it. Even today, for example, when people ask me, how do you compare India's strategy, China's strategy, I have a hard time actually articulating a clear, precise view of it. I can give you my personal view of it, but I don't think there's a collective national view of it. And I think this disruption is very important because it's happening, it's coming, and if you don't invest in that very seriously, we actually might risk missing it. Yeah, well, thank you uh, uh, for giving us uh, this perspective on India and how it's grown and as far as the future goes, what we need to in a way to use it. You know, the new way to come in the IT, the AI, the AI, uh, let's move on to you, Mark And, uh, you know, you were talking about a big growth engine for India with the infrastructure where there is a lot of deficit, if I may use that word. And, you know, you've been, in a way, keeping uh, away at the deficit, and, and there has been remarkable uh, success in certain areas, which I'm told now the highways are being built at. 29 kilometers a day, if that's correct. But let's, let's all learn from you about that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chairman, for that introduction. And I'd like to thank for Atlas for, and Frank for inviting me here. Uh, and good afternoon. Um, I just want to concentrate on infrastructure because I think it's the most important sector uh, for India's growth and employment 
in the next ten years, uh, and we have a certain problem there. Uh, India's requirement for infrastructure investment by 2022 is now officially estimated at about a trillion dollars. But I would say that it's probably more like three trillion dollars in the next five years. So that's the sort of investment capital we're going to require to get in the investment off the ground. And without these investments, we're not going to be able to generate the sort of growth that we would like. Um, I created an institution in 1997 at the Council of Government for the Infrastructure Development Finance Company, and I ran it for seven years. And in those seven years, we gave India all the infrastructure that we see today. Because when I took over the new company, 99% of all infrastructure was government owned and managed. And by the time I finished in 2004, we had brought huge private investments into infrastructure. So you could see the telecom industry was opened up by us. The road program was opened up by us. The private investment in ports was done by us. The, uh, our sector uh, reform was done by us. Uh, uh, so in a whole range of activities, we actually generated a huge private investment that you're seeing in India today. Uh, there was another institution called Infrastructure Leasing and Financial Services, which was much more project development company, and really used project development to lead private capital to especially the road project in India. And today you're seeing the uh, impact of that. Now the sad part is that IMF has gone bankrupt and has really created a massive turbulence in the non-bank financial intermediary sector in India, which is with its form. IDFC, the institution I created, has now abandoned the infrastructure sector and actually moved into uh, uh, becoming a bank. So it actually left this thing. So as a result of which, infrastructure does not have an institutional strength. Second, the banking industry in India is in severe crisis, as we heard earlier today. It's going to take many years to back the back of our business. And there will be no appetite by banks for infrastructure lending in the next few years. So as a result of which, when we need $3 trillion of investment, and we are not seeing that investment capital coming from the bank, and the two institutions that were actually designed for infrastructure have disappeared. We have a real problem. Who's going to do this? Is it just the ministries that are going to do it? Now, infrastructure is also a very complex issue. It's complex for finance, it's complex legally, it's uh, complex for public-private partnerships, it's very complex for structuring uh, projects appropriately, it's very complex on allocating risks appropriately. There's a huge element of trust that's required between the government and the private sector. Now, how do we get this to move? So at the moment, I think we are in limbo. What this government has now, I think you know, Modi uh, uh, coming back to power with this sort of majority, is that we have a clean sheet to start thinking about how we are going to get foreign capital mixing with domestic capital and government capital. Today, government is the largest center on infrastructure. We're back to where we were in 97. $62 billion is now invested by government itself. And the private sector has disappeared from the sector because they're all in trouble. So the question I have whirling around in my mind, though I'm not dealing with infrastructure anymore, is what would I do if I was prime minister? What would you do on infrastructure? What are the specific things you should do? I've come to the conclusion that we cannot make progress unless we have the best intellectual talent required to see that this process moves forward. It's a complex process. Unless you have very good minds working together, that's what we did in IDSC. I got the best minds I could find that really then dramatically opened up the public private partnership realm and created the sorts of uh, structures that you see today. But today, I think time to change.
think we need something else. And I wanted to share with you what I think we need, what India should do immediately, as of today, not even tomorrow. One is to establish a national commission on infrastructure. This is what Britain has done uh, after its whole PSI uh, history. And I think the National Commission of Infrastructure would be start by real talent drawn from all across the globe as well as India. And its basic purpose would be to securing India's international competitiveness through better infrastructure. Markets and connections that India requires for goods and services and people. How to prioritize investment to deliver inclusive economic growth and low carbon objectives. Demographic and other social factors that have to be brought in. Urban development and city development is a huge area that India is really lagging behind. So we have to have a strategy for that. Technological change and innovation, how can we bring all this to bear? Uh, and then, of course, all the considerations around development, ownership, financing of infrastructure. So in a sense, the agenda is huge, and it requires very strong intellectual capital to bring all of this together to advise government as to what, how we sequence those investments as we move forward, and how we could attract those investments as we move forward. But that's not enough, because the National Commission of Infrastructure would be more of a strategic think tank of actually putting a whole blueprint in place. This is what you are saying, is what is the strategy? How do you define the strategy? In China, it's very clear. But in India, we're not at all clear. And don't forget that the national agenda and the state agenda can be very different. So the states have to be very much part of this. My second component of the National Commission on Infrastructure would be what I call the double I initiative. And I spell it E Y U I. India Infrastructure. Two I. And this would be a development bank. You know, we have gone, we've, we've left the development banking structure behind. And I think India desperately needs to reinsert development banking as part of the agenda in the Indian context. And I think for infrastructure, this could be the first time that we can do that. And this will have substantial project finance experience. Project finance as an experience base has disappeared from India. The banks don't have project finance experience. They're not doing project finance. So we have to really bring this back. In fact, I have to train my people in the best uh, project finance uh, areas around the globe so that we would have that expertise. But that's lost now. We have to reinstate it. We have to develop financeable projects and to apply policy norms and strategies developed by the National Commission on Infrastructure on the ground. So the development bank would actually create the resources and create the structure, the structured product that would get infrastructure financed on the ground. But this would also mean that the state has to be involved. And the state level intellectual talent in this field is very, very limited. So we need to actually boost that intellectual talent at the state level. But the infrastructure happens in the state. It doesn't happen at some national level. It happens at the state. So double I would have state level entities as well to drive the state policy paradigm and the state transactions and investment that happens within the state. Um, it could also be a very important element for international finance because when people are looking for capital to invest in India in infrastructure, it's a very complex area. So nobody understands it. So you have to have an institutional presence which actually provides that understanding and provides that comfort to investment in, in, on the ground. So I think this is all it's a, it's a dual thing. We have a national commission which looks at the think tank, the strategy, the processes, and a development bank that actually executes on the ground a national commission agenda. So that's in very brief what I would do if I was in charge, the really difficult task to do. Yes, but I think without this, this idea of just leading it to the ministries and to the banks is not going to give us the sort of $3 trillion they're going to require. They're going to need an institutional mechanism 
which actually can attract and keep very, very uh, high powered individuals working with it. I think you have to pay them. I mean, there's no question about it. So, how you build those cultures and all that is something that I don't want to discuss today. So, let me conclude by saying India has a wonderful opportunity to attract capital and develop its infrastructure in the next five years. This is a God given possibility. And the whole world is looking to invest. Every investor that I meet with, and we would love to invest, but we don't know where to go, how to do it, and whether what's on the ground is, is meaningful. So once you can put that in place, you will attract capital. And this we need what I call the three C's. The three C's are what drives almost every international, global, international city where finance is very much part of it. It's New York, London, Tokyo, uh, wherever. The key thing is clarity. Clarity in approach. If you don't have clarity, nobody's buying into your story. Two, consistency. How consistently you are a day able to actually drive that clarity. And three, certainty. Certainty of the policy framework certainty of the tax law, you cannot keep chopping and changing and sending wrong messages right across the globe. C, C, C. Clarity, consistency, and uh, uh, certainty. And let me leave you with my favorite uh, quotation from Seneca, which is first century um, And it's a, you know, when he said, if you do not know which force you are sailing, no wind is sailing. Right? Now, the trouble is in an era of exponential change, where every company is facing an existential threat. Today, none of our companies would I sit on very well. We don't know what five years is going to bring. There's an exponential change. So you can't predict the future as you put in the past because it was extrapolating change on a linear line. But today it's exponential. So you have a real problem of even understanding to which spot you want to stay. So that is the crisis of our time. And for that, you need CCC even more. You need great clarity of what it is you want to achieve. Can you tell us in one word if I may describe it? It's a huge, difficult task. Are you optimistic or not? I'm very optimistic. I think I if, we do, if we do the right thing, That's right. if we do the right thing, India will never look back. But we need to do the right thing. We need CCP. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So you please uh, relocate your city house back in India <laughs> come and do some hard work because it really requires a lot of hard work and, and the reason which you just talked about. But let me move now uh, to my friend uh, Richard. Richard, uh, you're going to talk about anything you like, as long as it's brief, but it's certainly startups. Sure. Right? So I think um, uh, we have heard about innovation, we heard about R&D, we heard about infrastructure, we heard about financial services, and my favorite topic which Nasser actually mentioned was the development bank. I've always held that we need a very, very strong development bank considering, uh, you see, if you look at India, we have some great infrastructure projects, which is represented by the airports, and if you go into India now, you see those airports. But you see the infrastructure companies all are sick. So there has to be an answer to that. And maybe a development bank would have been an answer to some of that. And I think Nasser raised it, but I'm not getting to that now because both of them have enumerated it to a great extent, so they've taken some of the steam out of what I wanted to say on those topics. But I think it's very important to look at the five mega trends that are going to drive the Indian economy. The first one is the consumption story. I think India, right from 91, Rajiv, you mentioned about the opening up of the economy. We were at $300 million reserve, and we were on the verge of collapse, and uh, I think the consumption story grew, uh, actually made India grow where it was. Two things happened that time. One was the consumption story, and the second was the FDI that came into India, which actually helped propel the economy because there is lack of capital in the country. And I think that's an important thing, and that came in because um, 
I think the economy opened, uh, the multinationals and the foreign companies saw some big interest, they saw a big market in India, and they came there. But the important point is that India has not achieved its true potential as far as the middle class is concerned, as far as the buying power is concerned. And in a few years from now, we will see India and possibly China is already there, but India will also emerge as maybe the second largest middle class, true middle class buying power hub, which will help companies to come into India and look at it as a good market. The second one was the reform agenda has to carry on. What happened in the reform era was we did the easy reform, now we got to do the difficult reform. And the difficult reforms are painful, economy goes through its challenges, but we have to go through it if we want to cross over to the next level. So what was the single largest reform that happened in the last few years? One was the GST, the single point tax, goods and service tax which came in, which will have a big impact on the economy in a positive sense. In the, currently, there are challenges, but those challenges will get over. The second is the insolvency code. Uh, we have heard Nasser talk about all those assets getting stuck, money getting stuck. We had a twin balance sheet problem where the banks could not lend and the companies could not borrow because of. So now with the insolvency code, hopefully that will get addressed. Okay, there are some issues there, but we get addressed. Like any new reform will take its time. And the third one was opening up the FDI. I think if we take from an FDI policy, maybe India is one of the most friendly FDI countries in the world, except for a few instances where we have some challenges. Uh, because uh, if you look at today, if a foreign investor comes to India, he can literally go and invest into anything, except very few restricted sectors or places where he needs government approval, otherwise he has that goal. The third one was urban infrastructure and renewable energy push. We have got a huge push towards renewable energy, the future of energy which is going to move away from the current uh, power plants that we have, smart cities, <coughs> housing for all, which is happening in India, which will be a great driver. Because one of the biggest employment generators is going to be construction industry. And if construction industry gets it back, I think we would be able to, uh, you know, we would be back again in the job creation and uh, the other push. So I think that is, and uh, we have done a report where it actually came out that construction employs the most. Uh, the fourth trend which we see is transport and logistics. Uh, we know that uh, these industrial corridors and all that are getting planned in India. Uh, the one area which I want to talk, I don't want to talk about the normal rail and road, uh, hopefully those corridors. India is today possibly the most expensive logistics in the world. To transport goods from one end to the other is possibly the most expensive. And once that gets done, uh, dealt with the industrial corridor, I think we've come, up, come a long way on that. But the other one which has remained untouched is the whole water. I mean, our inland waterways, we have not used it for transportation like many other Western countries have used it. I think that needs to get used much more because that brings down the cost of transportation almost very low. So that is one. And the maritime exports. I mean, if you look at our coastline on both sides, we've got huge coastlines. And how are we using India as a such a strategic position from the west to the east? I mean, this could be a great destination for moving goods, and India can become a global trading hub. We could have become a global airport hub, which we missed. Dubai took it over. But we could have, uh, we have now the opportunity of becoming a global trading hub, which we can, and that would require a lot of port infrastructure, require a lot of coastline development, creating economic zones across the, uh, across the coastline, and, uh, you know, opening up to the east and to the west, both sides, uh, one could uh, bring that out. So, creating new trade routes and getting back to its original power that India had. And the fifth trend is the digital revolution. <coughs> Uh, we have heard before that India is way behind on the digital revolution. Yes, we have a lot of plans. Uh, we have a lot of things of uh, inclusive uh, moving, you know, the, but we are moving at a very different pace. We cannot not miss this industrial revolution. Because actually this, this uh, IT uh, boom that is happening or this, this thing that is happening on the IT side is actually laying a level playing field for all countries, irrespective of where you are today in your economy, to actually dominate it. And whichever country or whichever company actually adopts this technology, 
and uses it to its advantage is going to be the winner. And that is going to be the winner of the world. And the India has an opportunity of actually uh, going about it. So this would be the, the mega trend. Now when we look at uh, the other thing which I would look at, uh, you know, what, how do you get, so what is this India story all about? How do you get it up to the next level? Uh, by the UN has predicted by 2027, India is going to be the most populous country in the world. It's going to overtake China. It's going to be the most. So basically we have this huge young power, you know, employment, which is going to be there. Now, is it a demographic dividend or is it going to be a demographic liability? That is something would be how we create our education system, need some very serious reform. The entire area of skilling, and when I talk of skilling, it's not just skilling the way we understand it today. It's about skilling, upskilling, reskilling, continuous skilling, because all the jobs that can be automated are gone. Humans will not do it anymore. They're going to be done by machines. So what are these people going to do? What are all these delivery boys going to be doing? What are these other people who have created employment? What are they going to be doing? How are we actually skilling them? And this will require a huge amount of effort on the private sector, the government, and everybody concerned about the country. The other one is this agri-reform. And when I talk of agri-reforms, I'm not talking the incremental things that we want to do on the agri-sector. Uh, talking about how do we get more people off the farm and doing work which is uh, in the, you know, uh, employable kind of activities around the, in the rural part of India and blur this thing which we have, rural and urban, blur it. Good examples, Kerala, Goa are good examples of where the rural urban divide has been sort of blurred to a great extent and it comes from various things that I want to get into it because we're not having a discussion around that, but it's done. We have lighthouses. We have examples in India. We can actually do it. The other one which we were discussing earlier in the panel, I thought uh, Nasser would raise it, is around the city. How do we actually build cities and make them, you know, governance of the cities and make them, which is creating all the issues around us, having cities been run by CEOs, by whatever name we may call him or her. And I think that is something that we need to uh, work on. And uh, uh, the... the Infrastructure we've already touched. Uh, uh, the, the other one is around the forest reserves that we have within the country. We have a huge amount of forest around $420 uh, billion today the forest reserve. Can we put some of that money to better use to some productive effect? Uh, where there's a crime need for this money, could we use some of this money to uh, do that? So these would be some of the points right from my side, which I want to just leave your financial discussion. Yeah. Okay, I can No, no, no. I think you had enough time. Okay, we go to the startup entrepreneur ourselves. So, Vinayana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajiv, and thank you, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm a foreigner, so I can only speak as a foreigner. I cannot give advice on, especially with such a distinguished panel. So, um, uh, I will start from the visit when my business partner from India visited Slovenia, where I come from. Uh, it's a small country, very small, but what has in common with India is we have quite young democracy. Uh, and the region in the past has been working with India quite a lot, but recently he was the one who realized that there's nothing going on between the regions, so he said, let's do something to enforce uh, this uh, flow of uh, energy, um, uh, capital, of products, services, uh, technologies between the two regions, and this is actually what our idea to do together. Uh, we formed the joint venture uh, uh, in Delhi uh, two years ago, and I must say uh, the process was not really easy, but okay, we've done it. Uh, we can discuss it later, and how long does it take, how much documentation you, have, you need, and how much time is the street, uh, um, um, you have to do the same thing uh, all over again. But now, now it's on. Um, what we want, uh, so when we're talking about FDIs uh, uh, to India, um, you're mostly thinking about the big corporations, but there is also uh, uh, room for small and medium enterprises. And small and medium enterprises, they have a different, maybe, maybe obstacle, which is nothing for a big company. It could be 
for a smaller company quite quite a big one. But it doesn't mean that the smaller or medium sized company doesn't have interesting technologies, interesting products. It could be um, produced in India. Uh, but not just for India, but also for the world, because we see India as a very competitive country for, for whatever new technologies could be there. So we see as a potential FDIs also in medium uh, and small companies. Uh, but also, I would like to speak about uh, startups. That's something we touched also today when we were having a small briefing. Um, I'm in a um, uh, strategic council of uh, um, Business Angels Europe Network. I also invested in a, a women business angel fund. So I've been learning quite a lot about how to really do uh, angel investing well. And um, what Slovenia was facing, um, and that could also be, be interesting for India maybe, um, our mentality, our culture is that if you fail, you are stigmatized. And I heard that this is the same thing in India. So. Um, what we were changing first was like, okay, you can fail, no problem, you know, you can go to whatever sort of procedure and, and you can start again and you have added value, same as the nuance. But it, it takes time for culture to change how, how we view um, uh, startups. Um, the government has also um, uh, imposed a very good tax uh, uh, incentives for, for startups. So, if you are investing in a startup, um, you um, and if you stay in that investment for like five years' time, you don't pay any corporate profit tax, and that really boosted uh, the startup. So we established uh, um, the network of mentors. Uh, we have established uh, a lot of this um, picture parks. So um, if you look like five years back, we had 14% unemployment rate, which for us was quite, quite a bit, and a lot, especially the problem was that young people who were educated were leaving, leaving the country. So when these uh, um, measures took place, and they're very simple measures, it's nothing special, um, now we have 4% unemployment rate, like after five years, and there are a lot of startups and a lot of good ideas, and actually we would like to leverage those ideas with the rest of the world. So. I see India as one of the potential places where this could happen. So when we were talking, uh, coming back to FDIs, when we were talking about certain projects, um, the thing was that there are a lot of barriers on uh, to do this. So first you need to import some, some goods to India to establish the market, and then you start producing. This is always like that, usually. Uh, but I saw a lot of uh, a lot of barriers on, on that because everybody just thinks we want to sell. Actually, a lot of companies think we have to establish our market space in India first, and then we can start producing and producing not just for India but also for for other countries. And this is something that I see as a as a potential. Uh, I will not be very smart on on the topics you have because you know them much better. I think you uh, tell you do a lot. You've been attending a lot of India sessions, at least five of them in the last five years, and that made you brave enough to invest. I think you're doing the right thing. And in India, they say that a lot of money is made, but you have to be a little patient. And in the old days, the patient was perhaps uh, not seven months, but maybe three and a half years. Would not come down to seven months, and hopefully, as you keep uh, benchmarking us with the years ahead, with the various indexes, we will uh, really move ahead. But we have now uh, just uh, over 12 or uh, just under 12 minutes uh, left. So, before I hand over the floor to you, let me just get uh, a yes and a no in terms of do you see. Or does the panel see India as a major player in the globe in the next 10 years? Are we going to be the engine of growth which we wish to talk about at each function? A quick word, yes or no? Yes. yes. Good. So we have the kind of within India and within our European centers. So thank you. Now, with this, can I move over for a first question from the audience? Uh, since the last
lights are quite bright. Uh, can you sort of just raise your hand and request for a mic? Yeah, here we are. Which is about when you talk about infrastructure financing and the plan, the path that you see for infrastructure financing in India. Do you see any role of the capital market? Oh, very much so. Without the capital market, it's going to be very But I think we need an institutional presence as well that would tap or help tap the capital market. Uh, in the end of the day, you have to create a new generation of private sector players as well. Uh, the usual lot who've been, who've been active in the last 10 years are in deep trouble for over-leveraging and all of that. So we have to start from scratch again. Um, uh, but that will only happen once there is some clarity and there's some consistency and certainty in how this uh, sector is going to play out. Uh, there's too many risks, too many unknowables uh, at the moment. And I think capital markets will be a little uh, shy of, uh, of uh, you know, for, for, capital, for fund flow at the moment. So it's a matter of um, uh, who taps them and what is the quality of that. Then you have to find back here. Oh, back here. Go ahead. We'll come back to you later. Hi, I'm Vijay Sandamurthy. I'm um, a lawyer. I do a fair amount of work in infrastructure projects. So one of the problems that I have faced is, uh, to put it delicately, overzealousness from uh, governments when it comes to project documentation and project terms. Uh, ironically, there have been a couple of situations in which I have been mandated by governments to renegotiate agreements that have been already signed with developers because it is simply not bankable on the terms that were offered by the government. So the government took a very rigid approach. So uh, as Nasser, you mentioned, the infrastructure success story is all about the state governments. So the challenge is, how do we strike a balance between being uh, sensible and uh, uh, rational regulators preventing against fraud on the one hand, and on the other hand, making sure that the documents are not turning out too one-sided, so one-sided that they are becoming unbankable. I'd like to get your perspective on that. Thank you. So, I think this is really something we did in IDFC uh, a lot. And I think what I'm saying is that the new double I should really be playing the same role. Uh, because governments are part of IDFC, they own 40% of IDFC, we were trusted by the government and we were trusted by the private sector as well. So the documentation that we came up with, let's say for four private sanctions, those were designed by us. And it is on that basis that those transactions happen. So in a way, it wasn't government imposing its will on the system, like you, you try and push too much risk to the private sector, or you push, push inappropriate risk to the private sector. Uh, while the government doesn't take the sort of risk that they ought to be taking, let's say land risk or some other risk. So in a way, it is a risk allocation that is very, very critical. Um, the, you know, for example, the annuity uh, financing of roads was something that I was called, in fact, when we started it, I was called the great highway robber by uh, Business World magazine. So this is a way of robbing the system. It is nothing but an output-based contract where the government actually puts an output and the private sector builds, maintains, and drives that output. And the government pays for it. Right? Because these are in non-commercial uh, non infrastructure. Let's say rural roads or roads where toll tolls are not possible. But today, it is institutionalized as annuity financing a role. It's totally acceptable. It's been a, it's been a structure that's worked uh, 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 its way. So not to make too long a point of it, but I think the critical thing, as you say, is the documentation that is bankable 
and which allocate risks appropriately, and both sides have to uphold the sort of risks that they have uh, have signed up on. Can we have the question from here? Thank you so much, Monica, guys, for Mercury. Historically, India has been an inward looking superpower, and I would like to come back to the point mentioned by the first panelist. Do you see this changing over the next five, ten years? And where do you see the change taking place first? On the political aspect or on the economic aspect in terms of doing the artwork? Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I, I do see that uh, changing. And I think Prime Minister Modi is probably one of the first Prime Ministers to take a much more aggressive stance of positioning and protecting India's sort of, sort of uh, vision outside. And I do think now, with the current uh, backlash against China, uh, there is a nice little opportunity for India to strategically position itself much more closer to the U.S. Because whether you like it or not, the U.S. is the dominant majority, the dominant player in the world right now. And I think it is play to India's benefit to be able to work closely with the U.S. This does not mean to don't collaborate with others. You've got to collaborate with many players, but at least be very close to the U.S. So I do think that the uh, Indian government has a certain window right now which can leverage effectively to which to do so. Would you like to come in and answer that? So, to uh, her, I concur with what you're saying is that uh, the India opportunity for India is there at this moment, considering the trade war that is there at the moment. And uh, how well India, because political India is pretty well aligned to the U.S. It has to see how economically we actually get aligned and take advantage of that situation. And it would need to give some gives and take, you know, you know, give something, you'll get something in return. I think it will, it will amount to some of that. And uh, I think uh, from having a strong majority government at the center also make way for having some policy change. But I would just like to caution everybody out here on one point. There are three types of permissions are required when you come into India. One is at the central government level where you have one government, and then at the state government level and then the local bodies. There are three of these people who need to talk to each other. So any foreign investor coming to India needs to understand that the permission is not just at one level, it's at literally three levels, depends what kind of project you have. So I think that is something we, I would like to question on. Yeah, I, I think you have that experience, but perhaps, uh, Mariana, you, you may like to comment on uh, is India looking outward towards Europe adequately or not, from your perspective? Uh, I don't think that there are many companies from India that, you know, that are expanding to the European Union. And we have done some projects. Uh, there is one for company that we have them to expand into the European Union. Their sector is now already sending in, in Serbia. Uh, but uh, I would say um, perception of, of European companies towards uh, investing into India is, is a lot of fear because there has been a lot of um, maybe bad experience in past, I would say in recent past, but past. So they are very, very cautious about doing business with India. And I think if India would really also do some more steps in uh, law reinforcement, that would also give much more comfort to, to investors. And also dealing with corruption, which a lot has been done since a couple of years back, but corruption is still there. So I think it, it's something that has to be thought all, all the time to invest in foreign investments. Thank you. Well, we have two minutes left, so you want to invest in something. Thank you, Sandro. My question is to Mr. Mooney, that uh, green bonds, will it be handy for the infrastructure? And what is the kind of Indian government position on that? I think uh, green bonds will help a lot. Um, uh, it's already becoming quite a, quite a market. Um, I've just joined the board of Green Coal, which is a renewable energy company, uh, which started off with uh, 250 megawatts of renewable energy in India, but now is at 4 gigawatts, and it's owned by the government of Singapore. But so, and they are also into the green bonds. So I think the green bond financing today can be a very, I think that market is going to grow enormously uh, in the next few years. Uh, perhaps we could have uh, one closing statement from each of our panelists uh, on whatever they wish to say pertaining to this subject. So would you like to begin? 
that gives you more time. So I think you know the, the comment that I would make is uh, it's a very sweet window of opportunity right now for Indian government leadership. And I think India really needs to get all the various forces aligned to be able to move fast in such a determined fashion right now. I have a very simple question. I think India, we have to ask ourselves, are we fit for future? And do we have the institutions that are fit for future? And do we have the intellectual caliber that's fit for future? The answer to all of that is yes, so long as we can put it all together. And where we seem to be failing is putting all of that together. Right. Right. Yeah, the one area which I would look at is the SME and SME sector. Uh, which contributes about 28% to India's GDP. How do we actually grow it, fund it? And similarly, the startup, if we put startup into this, how do we actually make funds available at the right time and the right quantity? And the last, certainly not the least. So now we took it, but I actually wanted to reinforce that, uh, that uh, there is a lot of uh, potential to employ the 250 million young Indians who are searching for jobs with uh, startups. So we just have to enable those who are investing with the right incentives and also uh, teach them how to do it and be their mentor and to do that environment. And that is a, a big potential to employ a lot of young people and to also get their best ideas out. Well, thank you, uh, Liliana, and thank you, Richard, and Dr. and to Sylvester. I think we had a wonderful session. Please do join me in thanking our panelists.